السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات وسیم احسن ویلکم سی یو ٹو لیکچر نمبر سیون آف برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور ایٹ دی ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان ان دا لاسٹ لیکچر آئی ٹاکڈ اباؤٹ دی اسٹریٹجک مینجمنٹ پروسیس اینڈ آل دی بگ فائیو ایلیمنٹس دیٹ کمپرائز دیٹ پروسیس اسٹارٹنگ ود سیٹنگ اے ویژن فار دا بزنس اینڈ گوئنگ رائٹ تھرو آل دی فیزز of uh, setting objectives, crafting a strategy, implementing a strategy, and then the achievement of goals at the end. And then seeing to what extent management has been able to fulfill those goals. So that's the, uh, the management process I talked about. And I also talked about another fact that brand vision flows out of the overall business vision. Why? We did talk about that. and uh, in the hope that we understand how that brand vision flows out of the overall uh, business vision. Let me talk about a few uh, more topics today which are going to cover why brand vision and what purposes the brand vision fulfills and uh, what are the factors that set the stage for developing a brand asset uh, with the management model. Okay, having said that, the question which really flashes into your mind is, And it should be that way. After all, uh, the managers have been working for decades and rather centuries on brands. And uh, the why? The brand vision all of a sudden. Uh, managers know the history of the brands. They know the business they are doing. And they also know the way to go. So why is the need for stating in very clear words what a brand vision is and how we envision uh, the brand like, you know, five years down the line. There are many reasons uh, that we have for the brand vision in place. One of the reasons is the change in the structure of management. Uh, the very factor I talked about in the first lecture that uh, the hierarchy of marketing department has changed with the induction of uh, the brand managers. Brand managers being in place could play their due role. And that is the role which really supports the top management, starting with uh, the marketing manager and right up to the top person. How they do that? Okay, let us talk about it. Before we talking about that, let me state that there are authors who think, and rightfully so, um, about so many companies globally, not referring to the over market or over country, but rather globally, that... Uh, they do not really follow the well-structured path of uh, developing a brand vision and then stating the mission and then going through all the phases of uh, the strategic process. Why? I already have talked about that because they think they are pretty well conversant with uh, the history of the brand and the history of the business and therefore being at the helm, there is no way that uh, they can go wrong. And even if something does go wrong, they have the capabilities and the competencies to set things right. But then it may be too late. The approach of management it must never be reactionary. The approach of management must be proactive, meaning you have to preempt the many uh, possible uh, the bad things that may happen, knowing that anything that may go wrong, well, we've got to set things right even before the process has started. So... Having said that, what happens if you do not really have a brand vision in place? The very important implication of uh, the absence of uh, the brand vision is that you may not get support from the relevant departments. In the absence of that approach, meaning in the absence of a very well explicitly written vision statement, maybe there's a lack of support from the finance department. Maybe there's a lack of support from uh, the production department. The requisite investments may not be coming forward. The requisite development of human resource with which we all require in order to make things happen the way that we have envisaged may get thwarted because uh, people are not well trained to carry out the tasks which we have defined. And uh, therefore, the vision for the brand takes on an added significance, an added dimension. It fulfills 
three different purposes. One purpose brand vision fulfills is that it extracts a consensus out of management. And when I say management, meaning top management, uh, that also takes into confidence and has to be, it has to be that way, uh, the middle level of management and automatically the, all the layers of management get involved into the process. How does a vision extract that consensus or commitment out of the management? Let us talk about that. The traditional approach of uh, the setting business plan objectives has been about uh, setting certain percentages, meaning talking about certain added percent uh, with which the company envisages to achieve in the years to come. We might say we need to have another 10% of business growth by the end of uh, next year in order to be viable and profitable and to be able to achieve all the objectives that we envisage. And another 10% the year next and another so many percent the year next. When I talk about these percentages, I'm not saying that the traditional approach has been or still is whimsical. It is not that. The managements are pretty well conversant with uh, the history of their business. Like I said earlier, they are at the helm. They do know where they stand and they do know where they should go in order to reach the destination. What happens under this approach is that because of the added, I mean not the traditional approach, what happens under the new approach is that the brand managers, people like you, who are sitting at the new added layer in the hierarchy of the marketing department are there to help the top management. And they are there to help them bring about an improvement in the traditional approach, which is about, like I said, setting added percentage points in the years to come for the purpose of achievement. The brand management approach works in the following way. It is here that we start treating brands as assets. You have brand X, you have brand Y, you have brand Z. And all the brand managers within the company, or for that matter within the marketing department, are responsible for their respective brands. And having said so, those brand managers are to come up with objectives for their respective brands. When they come up with objectives, it automatically means, and it goes without saying, that they have done so with the help of a vision. They have a vision in place, they know the mission, and they have translated the vision and the mission into very uh, specific objectives which are quantified. With those facts and figures, you approach the top management, you bring the top management onto a common platform where they discuss all that and either they buy all that or maybe they reject all that or a portion of that, keeping the rest uh, as something bought in. Point is that they have now the advantage to say goodbye to the traditional approach and making use or making or extracting benefits out of the professionalism that has been inducted into the company by virtue of your presence. The change which the marketing departments have seen and are seeing by virtue of the presence of brand managers. So what happens that with those facts and figures, you convince the top management about the rationale and about the logic that you have behind the facts and figures you are presenting. And that leads to a commitment. With the help of that commitment, it takes care of the blame game that has been going on in the companies for as long as we can look back. People stop pointing fingers at each other that this is something I was not supposed to do. And that's something which you were supposed to do. But at that time, the damage is done. 
or even if a big damage is not done. Things that could have been achieved were a very clear-cut vision, a mission, and a set of values in place. So this is a sure indication that a company is not upholding its vision, mission, and the right set of values. And if it is, the result would be different, which I have talked about. You would be all set to go through the process of management in a well-structured way and then on your way to achieving the objectives that you set to yourselves. The second purpose a brand vision fulfills is it leads to market research. Why is there a need for market research? It is because no one in the company would like to operate in a vacuum. When I say vacuum, what I mean is, when you present facts and figures to top management, you have to present those with the help of certain logical findings. And those findings come forth only with the help of research. Nothing should be left to chances. Things have got to be quantified. If they cannot be quantified, you may come up with certain qualitative findings, but at least you have a logical basis to talk about that and to convince the management about. So market research is one of the fundamentals which you have to use, which you have to make, which, which, you, which you have to bring into play in order to come up with certain logical conclusions and logical findings so that you can go ahead with good, good decision-making process. It is marketing research which tell us which attributes to change, which new products to introduce, which new segments to cater for, and which new geographic areas to go after. It is only because of the findings that we have through the marketing research, and research is carried out in the, in the field. We all know that. So it is on the basis of those findings that we can make up decisions about which segments are more attractive in terms of profitability, or maybe in terms of volumes. You can get big volumes from one segment and may not get as big volumes from another. You also can concentrate your efforts in one geographic area in relation to the strength of your brand in that particular area and may reduce your emphasis, which you might think was kind of unnecessary or undue in another geographic area, which is not as promising as the one you have found out through research to be the most promising. So these are the kind of uh, the findings that you have to have before you make your case uh, for the top management, uh, for them to make the right decisions about the overall vision of the company in which your brand vision fits in. The third purpose which uh, the brand vision fulfills is that it mandates knowledge on part of all the stakeholders. Uh, who are the stakeholders? I think we all know that stakeholder is anyone who has stakes in the company. A stakeholder is different from a shareholder. A shareholder is the one who holds shares in the company, you know, who is part of the, uh, the equity uh, that the company uh, has to itself. But a stakeholder is the one who has, in one way or the other, some interest in the company, whose destiny is related with the company in one way or the other. So a distributor sitting in the marketplace is one of the stakeholders. A bank you know, that has financed your business is one of the stakeholders. So all the stakeholders they must know what is going on in the company. It is very important. Why? When they are in the picture, they are going to support you. And it is the support which you need all the time. When I say you need all the time, it is not only the brand managers, it is all the management who need support from all the stakeholders. And again, you see the very point that nobody wants to make decision. By the same token, nobody would like to lend their support to you if they are made to make decisions or if they are made to lend their support to you in a vacuum. So the vacuum has got to be fulfilled through certain logical findings and that 
leads to the fulfillment of the third purpose I'm talking about right now, meaning mandating knowledge on part of all the stakeholders. And you are the ones from where the process is going to be kicked off and through the top management and through to all the stakeholders as to where the company stands today and where the, where the company wants to reach. What are going to be the important points of transit between today and tomorrow where we have to reach? So market research, in other words, is the best guide in determining the perceived differences among different offerings of the brand or brands by consumers in different segments. That really gives us good knowledge, which leads to mandating that knowledge in terms of its dissemination to all the stakeholders. Having talked about these three purposes, which a brand vision fulfills, the meaning extracting consensus out of the top management and that leading to market research as a next step and also fulfillment of another purpose and then mandating knowledge on part of all the stakeholders. Let us now take a look at a vision statement which I have prepared hypothetically for you to understand the whole process with an element of, I would say, a little practicality. I have said this is a hypothetical statement of a company's vision, but uh, take it for granted that this uh, the hypothetical uh, situation is very close to being quite very practical. So let us take a look at the statement. The statement says, the company will enter the fast food category by introducing a range of sandwiches with brand name XYZ. You are clear. The company will introduce a range of sandwiches by the name of brand XYZ. And the company is going to enter into the category of fast food. The sandwiches will have health food appeal for lunchtime in particular and anytime later in general. It will price the entries by entries. The statement means all the offerings. It is not going to be just one sandwich. It is going to be a range of sandwiches. That is why it says entries. The word entries or offerings mean the same. It will price the entries within the consumer friendly range to optimize the number of customers who are professionals within the age bracket of 20 to 50 years. It will attempt to reach its potential customers very close to where they are. We have now talked about the statement. You have seen it. Let us now start analyzing this statement. Let me say a few words in support of it. What this statement in a summarized form saying that the range of sandwiches which the company intends to introduce are going to be well priced. So the company is talking about affordability for its target consumers. The company is saying it is going to make sure that the sandwiches should be available to its target market at points which are close to where they are. So the company is talking about accessibility and the company is also talking about quality sandwiches. In other words, the company is going to provide their market with quality sandwiches. So three elements which the company is talking about in support of the statement or which are very implicit in the statement are affordability, the factor of quality and the factor of accessibility. When we take a close look at these factors, we shall think to ourselves, this is a huge task. It takes a lot to be able to produce quality products. 
the questions which will come to our mind would be while devising strategies, while crafting strategies, different strategies, do we have the right materials available? The company's answer to this question must have been yes. That is why it is saying it plans to enter. Another question which comes to the mind is, does the company have the right human resource? The answer must have been yes. If the company has the right resource, the next question is, are they well-trained? Even if the company knows, yes, they have that background before they join our company, still they have to be further educated in relation to the culture which this company is trying to develop or which this company thinks it must develop. So the process of developing those people will go on and on. Another question, which again is a very, very heavyweight question, is of accessibility. Does the company really have the resource to be that quick in providing that accessibility factor to its target market? Is it that the company is, is it that the company is going to come up with restaurants all over the place, or the company has something else up its sleeve when it comes to providing that kind of service to the customers in order to be quick in its service. Also implicit in this statement is the factor that the company is not only selling a product, the company also is selling its service. And the service relates to the delivery. Because the company is talking about accessibility and the company is saying it has to be quick and it has to be very close to where the customers are, so what it has up its sleeve maybe is the factor of delivery. And we shall talk about that when it comes to the mission and when it comes to uh, the values and when it comes to the further elaboration of the statement. I was talking about different components which form this statement in relation to its implications in the marketing area, in the operations area, and also in the area of service market, not only product market, but also service market. Let me state uh, in support of the vision statement another uh, factor. The company envisions to start its business from the largest market of the country, which of course is Karachi. After achieving a certain level of success in that market, the company envisions to spread into different geographic areas in terms of uh, the level of potential and promise they offer. How the company is going to do all that? Let us take a look at the brand mission statement. The brand mission statement of the company says, XYZ's mission is to develop fast food outlets with appealing but economy-driven architectural features from where it can serve its customers through highly trained and motivated crew. Part of its mission is also to simultaneously develop a team of delivery personnel conversant with the job of delivering food with high efficiency and low operational costs. What does this statement say? Let us try to analyze this. Now, first of all, let me say that this statement is very present-oriented. It might sound like a little future-oriented because it says it is going to develop, it is going to do this, and it is going to do that. It is because this company is a new player in the area of uh, fast food, and it is just going to start. So anything which is at hand and is going to be started has to be taken in the light of the present and not in the light of future. So therefore, this mission statement is present related and not future related. You might start having some kind of confusion that I've been talking about mission relating to present and vision relating to future. And therefore, I need the feel for clarifying for you 
that this mission is very much present oriented and not future. Now, this is talking about quite a few things. It is talking about the market segment the company is planning to reach. It is talking about economy-driven restaurants and which automatically means that the prices it is going to offer are going to be consumer friendly, which was the part of vision. And it was the part of vision because it is going to be translated into financial goals which are going to be achieved not over uh, the next year but also in the years to come. This statement also talks about um, the delivery mechanism. The delivery is going to take place not only through the restaurants where customers are going to walk in by themselves. It is also going to take place with the help of the delivery personnel who will go to your doorstep in order to deliver those sandwiches. Now when we talk of that, it automatically means that people have got to be well trained. Well, the statement talks about that and also they have to be motivated. Uh, just imagine receiving a delivery person who is not really motivated and who has uh, all the, the looks of an angry man uh, on his face delivering that sandwich to you and it looks to be in a hurry, you wouldn't like to either receive the sandwich or even if you have received it, you may not like to order it the next time, which is the crux of the matter. So the statement talks about so many different things and it has to be dissected and analyzed in different forms of its components and elements. Element of the pricing, the element of delivery, the element of operations. Uh, the operations have got to be very efficient because uh, the only an efficient operation can handle consumers who are walking into the restaurant and the consumers who are going to be served through your delivery personnel. And that is why I talked about the combination of two different sets of marketing, the product marketing and service marketing. So this is a very interesting case in which we are going to talk about not only the product itself, but also about the delivery the mechanism which falls in the domain of service marketing. Having said that, uh, let us now further talk about the implication of the components of the mission statement, which is a translation of the vision statement. We are talking about uh, the segment which we are going to cover, and we are talking about a certain range of pricing that we have in our mind. We are going to test that. And after the test has taken place, we are also going to see to it that uh, the range that we envision uh, to launch in the market gets completed in terms of its launch because it may, not, uh, it may not be the case that the complete range is going to be launched on the very first day. It takes time before you can complete the range which you see in the market um, doing its job, meaning selling. So as you have learned, the vision statement and mission statement of this company XYZ they have their implications in different areas. To summarize the whole thing, in the area of uh, the target market, in the area of uh, the brand differentiation, which the vision talks about uh, the brand being uh, the health food, uh, how they're going to create that differentiation, we are going to talk that uh, at the relevant time. But the company is very much sure and confident that it is going to come up with something which is uh, health food, meaning which is different from uh, what you have in the market right now, about which people generally complain that this is um, not so good food. I am not here to use the terminology which is used in the marketplace, but uh, to give you an idea of uh, uh, the, the anger or uh, the displeasure of uh, the consumers, so they're not very happy with whatever they get in the market. So this company thinks it can really come up with something which is different from the existing offerings um, in the market, and hence, is going to have a very attractive appeal for its target market. The uh, implication of um, these statements also uh, falls uh, in the geographic areas, it falls in the area of uh, operations, it uh, also in, falls in the area of uh, values, uh, which I did not talk about earlier. The company does believe that it is going to have in place a set of values uh, which profess which professes integrity of character, 
conscientiousness when it comes to working uh, in the restaurants or in the kitchen for that matter, and uh, honesty and so on and so forth. Now, these are the attributes in terms of for the human character which we do talk about uh, wherever we are in any field that we are related to. But how do you make sure that people do take on these values? This is the subject which falls under the domain of human resource management. This being a new company, they may not have a very well-structured human resource management department. So that becomes kind of a challenge for the company as to how to go for uh, the screening process through which they're going to have people who already have these values. My point is, all these implications lead us into various areas of strategies. And for each area, we have to have a strategy, meaning a game plan, so that we can get the desired results, so that we can translate those game plans into different sets of executions in order to get the results that we have envisaged. After having talked about the vision, the mission, and the implication of these two statements, let us now take a look at the graphical presentation as to how the company started thinking about uh, segmentation, uh, differentiation, and how the company has related its pricing strategy with the target segment and uh, the product quality. It is very interesting and educative. So let's take a look at the graphical illustration. We have uh, this figure in front of us, and we can see two axes, the x-axis and the y-axis. The x-axis is price, while the y-axis is quality. Price increases from zero upwards to the right, and the quality in qualitative terms increases upwards. We have divided x-axis into five different segments, which you might call price segments. The first one is between 0 to 25 rupees. The other one is from 25 upwards to 45. The third one is between 45 and 80. And the next one, 80 and 100. And the fifth one, beyond 100 rupees. If you look at the dividing lines going upwards along the y-axis, which is the quality axis, you will see at the top of the lines, we have competition, we have this brand or this company XYZ, and we have different segments of the market in relation to the pricing we see at the bottom of the axis. Segment one is the low market segment because it is between zero and 25. Well, nothing sells at zero. Uh, let's talk about the pricing, which is uh, in the range of 20 to 25 rupees. And uh, we do have roadside cafes or roadside stalls uh, where people sell sandwiches uh, at this price range. So this is you know, what we call, or what the company calls, low market segment. And the company is not represented there. The next segment to the right is what the company calls low mid market segment. And this is segment number two. And this is the price range of 25 and 45. And you can see, with the help of the red thick arrow, it's all competition. Company XYZ does not have its representation in these two segments. Then company XYZ takes a hard look into segment number three, which it calls mid-market segment. And this mid-market segment is between 45 and rupees 80. XYZ has decided not to be represented in this segment for the time being, as you can see from the graphical illustration. And that takes us on to the next segment, which is segment four. And the company calls this segment mid-high market segment. This is the most vital segment for company XYZ because it is going to have all its action in this segment because it is the target market. And this is between rupees 80 and rupees 100. 
we can see that with the help of the green arrow, thick green arrow, which tells us that this is the arena or the, the playing field where company XYZ is going to restrict itself for the time being. Beyond that, there's a segment which you might call the high market segment. And you might question, why is it that company XYZ is not wanting to get into this segment, if not forever, at least for the time being? I'll come to the answers one by one. But the fact remains that XYZ is not going to be represented for the time being in this segment, which is beyond 100 rupees. Now, before I explain that, let's take a look at the three lines which are parallel with the price line, but which are not price lines, which are quality lines. The first line, the red one, which runs parallel immediately next to the price line, meaning X axis, is what company XYZ calls low quality line. And this quality line intersects the price lines, the two price lines which you see on this diagram or this illustration. One is the market price line, or in other words, market price curve, and the other one is the XYZ price curve. And this quality line cuts these two price lines at two specific points. One point of intersection, the first big yellow dot which you see is the competition. And this is what the company calls price quality index, PQI. A terminology which you will see at the top of the lines if you take a look upwards, but not for the time being. So this is the PQI of competition in the low segment of the market where XYZ does not exist, but then it has to have very good knowledge of the market, the way it operates. There is no way that this company can, meaning XYZ can ignore this segment. It must be fully in the picture. If you go a little upwards, you will see the blue line, and this is what the company calls, I mean XYZ calls, the mid-quality line. This line again cuts the true price curves or the price lines at two different points. I think the understanding here is very clear. If you go further up, you will see another line which company XYZ calls top quality line. This top quality line is a constant. And this company says, and rather it states, that the quality, the best quality which is available on the market at the moment is this quality. And this quality line, wherever it intersects the two price lines of XYZ and the competition, those are the price quality indexes or the respective price quality indexes of XYZ and of the competition. So in other words, when we take a look at the two yellow dots, meaning at the two PQIs, one relating to XYZ and other relating to competition, we can very easily conclude that the quality of XYZ is the same as the quality offered by the competition at that axis because this line of quality is a constant. Whereas the price of XYZ is lower than offered by the competition. You might also think, and rightly so, that the red arrow, which you can see in the top segment, meaning the highest price segment, the thick red arrow, it does not extend leftwards, and XYZ has the whole field to itself, where it is going to play. Well, that is the result of marketing research. This is where company XYZ found was a gap. And this is the strategic gap which company XYZ, in terms of a very consumer-friendly pricing and in terms of very good quality, is going to offer. Isn't this interesting? I think it's very interesting. This is because of the 
findings of the research in the marketplace that the company arrived at this conclusion that it must start from the segment which at the moment is relatively empty or rather is totally empty. There is no player in the market having representation there and therefore the point of attack as we call in, in the field of marketing, the point of attack has got to be right there in segment number four. And that's the way the company has defined the segment. I think it is interesting. Now, the next question, the theoretical question which I raised earlier, does the company have the competencies and the abilities to deliver all that it is planning and it is envisaging? It is not very difficult to say that we're going to be lower priced and yet we shall offer the same quality which is offered by sandwiches or burgers, so to say, offered at a price or offered within a price range which is higher than the one we're going to offer. The company is convinced, yes, it can deliver that. Well, if it really can, good. If it cannot, it will change its strategy or do something with the tactics in order to be at par or in order to be in line with the realities of life. If the company has gone a little astray at the moment, I think this explains this first illustration in um, pretty much detail. To summarize once again, uh, let me uh, say once again that uh, this illustration talks about five different price segments. And these price segments have very direct correlations with the level of quality which is being offered by these very segments in the marketplace. Quality is divided into three different levels. We have low quality in the marketplace, we have mid quality, and we have high quality. These quality levels are very relative, but if you start from the top, you can say that the highest level of quality is defined by the best available sandwiches on the market, and those best available sandwiches are the ones made available by international companies. And therefore, that's the kind of the optimal quality, if not the best quality, that's the optimal quality we have available to our consumers in the market. So let us start relating the quality levels with that. And uh, by the, uh, the presence of these uh, two very important uh, elements or the fundamentals of uh, the marketing, meaning pricing and quality, we are uh, in a position to take a very graphical look at this figure in terms of uh, the price quality segments. And uh, with the help of that, we have defined what a price quality index is. Khabatin Hazrat, Mira aap se sawal ye hai, jo already aap ke zehen mein bhi hoga, ki kya is company XYZ ko isi segment number four mein hi rehna chahiye? اور میرے ذاتی خیال میں آپ کے ذہن میں جو جواب ہوگا جو میرے ذہن میں بھی ہے کہ نہیں بالکل نہیں کتا ہی نہیں دا کمپنی مسٹ ڈو سم تھنگ ٹو گیٹ ان ٹو ادر سیگمنٹس ان آڈر ٹو بی ایبل ٹو ہیو مور میننگ فل پرزنس ان دا مارکیٹ پلیس دا بائی ناٹ آئی مین ایف دا کمپنی چوز سیگمنٹ نمبر فور اٹ واز کہ بیکاز دا کمپنی فاؤنڈ آؤٹ اور وا دا کمپنی ڈٹرمنڈ a strategic gap, the very competition was not really having its presence. And this is kind of a situation which is not offered in the marketplace every now and then. It happens seldom, but whenever it happens, you've got to be sensitive, uh, maybe as a new company or maybe as a company which already is in the marketplace, to sense that uh, so that you can uh, draw very accurate decisions uh, before we go ahead with your moves. And before you go ahead with your moves, of course, before you can really plan. That's what I mean. The company has got to get into segment number three, which is downwards. And the company also has to get into the segment number five, which is the top segment. And that is a segment where the real competition is going to be faced by this company. The question which really flashes into our minds is, 
When is that time? This again boils down to the vision of the company. The company has to decide to itself whether it will be comfortable dealing with that kind of a situation in one year's time or two years' time or three years' time. It is very difficult to be very specific in terms of time frame, but at least you can have certain plans that this is a segment which I'm going to touch like, you know, the 12 months down the road, not before that, because we would like to be well prepared in terms of our competitive strengths and in terms of a posture which really becomes threatening for the competitors. And therefore, let us consolidate our base in segment number four first and then move on to segment number five or for that matter, segment number three. If you have to move to segment number three, which carries with itself a lower PQI, it doesn't mean that's a piece of cake. It is not that. When you are going downwards, you again have competition to face. You again have dynamics of that segment of the market. People have different expectations. Maybe the expectations are not going to be drastically different. But uh, the question is, and the fact remains, that the differences of dynamics are there and you're going to develop certain findings uh, which are going to bring about certain changes in the product makeup and the way the product looks like and the way that you um, communicate uh, with that segment. What is that? Well, communication again may not vary very drastically. The price will differ. The brand name will differ and brand name will differ in all probability in terms of the layer of the brand. I'm talking in reference to the layers of brand so that you really can hone your understanding of layers of brand. XYZ is the principal brand. XYZ is the umbrella brand. XYZ is the family brand. Just to let you recall that lecture on brand layers. And the sub-brand in segment number three is going to be, for example, XYZ1. And by the same token, when you move to the upper segment, which is segment number five, maybe you're going to have something like XYZ2, so on and so forth. So this is the way the whole process works. But again, the question is, moving leftwards, which is the lower PQI, or moving rightwards, which is the higher PQI, it boils down to the competencies and the abilities. If we are talking of a lower price segment, do we really have the ability to maintain the same quality level to which people have become accustomed to? You will recall, I talked about brands maintaining their own standards. Not only maintaining their standards, enhancing their standards. Taking the benchmark from here to there, and then making this point the, the new benchmark and the new standard. So the question is, do we have the ability to maintain the same level of quality and yet being able to sell that quality at a lower price? And if we do that, how do we do that? Are we going to, well, whatever we have talked about, one thing is taken for granted that we're not going to compromise the quality. So how do we attract customers and how do we maintain them? We have to do something with maybe the filling. Maybe you're going to reduce the weight. Or maybe you're going to look into the local market in terms of certain suppliers who are more competitive than the ones you already have because you have to achieve a new challenge and that challenge is maintaining lower cost in terms of your presence in a newer segment which carries a lower PQI. So these are the kind of challenges which companies face. These are the kind of abilities with which you, know, you have to I wouldn't say manipulate, but with, with which you have to be flexible with, whereby 
the end result is not compromised, meaning quality. You are willing to sell the product at a lower price. When we are talking about the upper segment, which is all about good quality and also high price, maybe it is not going to be as difficult as dealing with the lower price segment, but again, it poses new challenges. You have to have the competitive advantage, and the competitive advantage is going to be achieved either by lower cost or by a higher quality level. If you are not in a position to attain a lower level of cost because you think to yourself and you also can convince the top management that there is no way that we are going to compromise the quality and therefore we are going to maintain our suppliers and not only maintain suppliers but we are going to maintain the same level of quality they are supplying us with. Therefore, cost cutting, forget about that. Let's talk about increasing the price and um, giving the consumers a higher quality. This poses new challenges. What are those challenges? We shall continue our discussion on that in the next lecture. For the time being, let me summarize what I've talked about today. I picked up the threads from where I left in the last lecture, meaning overall vision of the company, the strategic management process, how brand vision flows out of the overall business vision, and where that leads us to. We are right now in the middle of that process. We shall keep talking about that. Thank you for your patience. I look forward to talking with you in the next lecture. Khuda Hafiz.